Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us say together the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, who at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, proclaimed him your beloved Son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made, and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God in glory everlasting. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you were at our in-person Christmas Eve service, you know this, but if you weren't, it was cold. And it, it wasn't just cold. Uh, it was sort of the night, at least to me, maybe hopefully not to you, but to me, it was kind of a comedy of errors. Uh, the wind was blowing so hard that the lovely poinsettias that were everywhere just kept blowing over. Um, we couldn't keep the veil over the chalice. We couldn't keep it in place. It kept threatening to kind of blow all over the place. Um, the, the sound system, uh, Tim and I still don't know what was happening, but the sound system through which we, you know, play things and, and, and amplify things, uh, there was some sort of ringtone that kept coming through the sound system. We have no idea where it came from, why it started, why it stopped, um, but th that kept happening. And I, I was so looking forward to this. I was thinking we are outside, people are wearing masks, I'm gonna just load the incense up and just smoke will be everywhere and no one will really complain because it's outside and we're all wearing masks. It was gonna be so much fun. And I forgot to order charcoal uh, which we ran out of at Easter, or not Easter, I guess last Christmas we ran, we ran out of. And so uh, it, I, I did not sadly get to do that. It was, uh, it was a, a night. Uh, basically, on a night that I'm usually full of joy and excitement, I found myself to be scattered and anxious and frustrated. And then it was time to start the pageant service. And right before we began to sing, it started to snow. Not a real snow that was going to stick, but just sort of tiny, hard flakes that came pelting down. And from the kids gathered in front of me, wearing their pageant costumes, there was this collective, yes! It was the wonder that I needed that night to remember the wonder of the story we tell each Christmas season. And that wonder means that I almost always have a very similar sermon this Sunday, the first Sunday after the Epiphany when we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. Because the, because, the, because the story we tell, so full of incredible things, angels singing, a virgin with child, the creator of the universe resting in a manger, sages from the east who come to worship him, uh, those things that we tell about the Christmas story, they can give the incarnation this sort of glossy, otherworldly quality. Most of us, in the course of our lives, haven't witnessed anything like that, have we? And so we need the story we tell today, the story of Jesus' baptism, because it provokes an important question, one that I've preached on the last few years during this occasion. Why? Why should the righteous one, the one sent to redeem the world, the one who will die for our sins and be raised to new life, why should he need this baptism of repentance? The answer upends the otherworldly Christmas story we tell. And it is because his baptism, the baptism of Jesus, is not about him as an individual but his identification with all of humanity and all of human experience. 
In his baptism, Jesus declares that there really is not a corner of human life that he's going to exempt himself from, even the depths of it all. This baptism sends him into the loneliness of the desert. That's the very next thing that happens in the story. It sends him eventually into his ministry with the sick and the poor and the hurting of this world. And this baptism sends him eventually to his own death. So we need to know that the incarnation, the presence of God with us in Jesus Christ, isn't just about some storybook character who kind of floats around. We need to remember that Jesus lived a human life. He learned to walk and talk. He had preferences about very human things. I imagine, what were Jesus' favorite foods? That's a question that you can ponder. I don't have any answer to it. Probably fish. There's lots of fish around. What was his favorite kind of music? What was his favorite thing to do? I suspect he had certain disciples whose company he preferred a bit more than other disciples. Jesus was fully human. We cannot let the Christmas glow dim the fullness of that reality. That was going to be my sermon this week. It was going to be a little bit longer than that. I had it all sketched out in my mind on Wednesday, after, on Wednesday around lunchtime. I had it sketched out. Then it became Wednesday afternoon. And as is often the case when these cataclysmic sort of things happen, I knew I could not ignore those events in my preaching. I just didn't know how to think about it or talk about it in a sermon. So I went to my seminary classmates' Facebook group. Great place to start. Try to get some conversation going. And I just said, what do you say on Sunday? As my question, my classmate, one of my classmates who has a reputation of being kind of a smart aleck, just replied, Jesus. It's a good Sunday school answer, Jesus. But dang it if he wasn't right. My focus today was going to be on Jesus, on the reality of one side of the mystery of the Incarnation, that Jesus lived a human life and thus is with us in all the heights and depths, the wonder, the ugliness, the shame, and the grace of what it is to be human. But that's only half the story. Because the heart of the Incarnation, at the heart of the reality that God was made human in the person of Jesus, there's a second truth. The church has always held it, but it is, if you can imagine, an even stranger truth than the first, that God became human. God was made human so that humans might be unified with God, might be brought into union with God. Jesus experiences all of what it is to be human and in turn gives us the gift that we might be drawn into the fullness of God's own love, God's own life. Normally, when we think about that, we think of it as some sort of sweet by and by reality. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. One day we'll get to go to heaven and won't it just be wonderful? Hear me, I'm not discounting that. I believe in heaven. I believe we will dwell with all the saints in the eternal presence of God. The trouble is that we believe our union with God needs to wait until that happens. But that's just not the case. That isn't what the mystery of the incarnation teaches us. Our union with God begins not at our death, but at our baptism, which is also a kind of death. Death to sin, death to self. In baptism, we are ushered into union with God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in baptism, we are to begin to live that life of union. And it begins not in the sweet by and by, but here and now. So what does this have to do with the events of this week? If Jesus knows the fullness of our humanity with all its joys and all its struggles, struggles, if he refuses to turn from that humanity even in the darkest corners of human life, doesn't that mean that in our journey to the fullness of union with God, there's no corner of our lives that shouldn't be subject to union with him? Specifically, in terms of what has happened this week, 
shouldn't our politics and the way we engage in politics, the way we interact with the realities of our world and our life together, shouldn't they be subject to a deeper and deeper union with God? I don't have grand answers about the events of this week. But I do know this. I know that Christians will only be good citizens of this nation if we understand that this nation is not our primary source of citizenship. We will only engage in politics that is good, that is virtuous, and that is just if we understand that our first call is to union with God in Christ. Our work in this world, which is incredibly important, our work in this world has to flow out of our work toward union with God in Christ. It has to be that way, and it cannot be the other way around. We don't become a good Christian by becoming a good American. We become a good American, a good citizen of this nation, when we become good citizens of the kingdom of God. So do not close off these fraught areas of your life from your call to union with God. Do not decide that God gets Sundays so God can just stay out of your politics. Do not accept the status quo of hatred and division which the leaders of the kingdoms of this world thrive on. Rather, remember that you are baptized. Remember the vows we will reaffirm in just a moment. Remember that just as Jesus plunged into the fullness of our human life, the fullness of your human life is likewise called to union with him. Friends, as we celebrate the incarnate one, as we witness his baptism this day, a symbol of his assuming the fullness of our human life, I call upon you to remember the promises of your baptism, where we vow to pursue union with him in the fullness of his divine life. Please join me now as we renew these promises. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers? I will with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will with God's help. May Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and bestowed upon us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in eternal life by his grace. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The Prayers of the People Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. 
grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Brian, our bishop, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for Donald, our president, and Joe, our president-elect, the Congress and the Supreme Court, for Bill, our governor, and Andy, our mayor. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the earth, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. We pray for the poor and the homeless. We pray for the sick. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. We remember those who have died, especially Loretta Casmir and Irid Lee, Give the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Friends, it is so good to worship with you today, uh, this Feast of the Baptism of our Lord. Uh, a special greeting and prayer to those of you who celebrate this day as your baptismal anniversary. I count in my household uh, one member of the family who does. And so it is, uh, it is a good day to celebrate and remember uh, the promises of baptism and remember uh, the reality of our baptism. Um, I, I don't have any major announcements about things coming up. Uh, I am looking forward to next week. We will have a special guest preacher. Um, Kat Chapel is a uh, junior in the School of Theology at Suwannee. Um, that is a first-year student. And so she will be with us for both our online and, Lord willing, weather permitting, our um, uh, in-person services next week. So you'll get to hear from Kat. Um, Kat is a, is, uh, was a prisoner at St. Paul, so I've known her for quite some time and um, a, a talented speaker, and uh, I think it, I'm, I'm really excited about her presence with us next week. Um, beyond that, I, uh, I, as I said, I think last week, we continue kind of with, with this status quo of our worship patterns for the foreseeable future, and um, we are praying for a downturn in virus soon. We are praying for a rollout um, that is smooth and successful for the vaccine. I invite your prayers in that direction as well um, as we, we all need to, um, uh, I think that we, we will all benefit from uh, a return to something like normal, hopefully in the not too distant future. In the meantime, as you have needs, as you have anything that, that I could be helpful with, that the church could be helpful with, please know that um, the, our, our phones are on, our emails are on, the email addresses are posted in the back of this bulletin that you have. Um, please be in touch with us as we can be helpful to you and as uh, you have need. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.